Hello and welcome to Behind the Scenes, GovTV's look at the film and television industry in Albuquerque. I'm your host, Tony Delaflora. Emmy Award winning producer Stuart Lyons has a formidable list of movie and TV credits to his name. Among the approximately 600 TV episodes he's worked on are such iconic shows as Taxi, Cagney and Lacey, and Everybody Loves Raymond. Most recently, he wrapped up a stint as line producer for what uh, many consider the best show in the history of television, Breaking Bad, of course, one of our favorites here. Um, but while many were mourning the end of the show, Mr. Lyons was already on to his next project, The Night Shift, about life in an emergency room at a San Antonio hospital. Um, today, he'll take us behind the scenes for a glimpse into the life of a television producer. You're a busy man, Stuart. Thanks for... <laughs> Thanks for making time to come over My and uh, hang out with us. Um, again, one of, the, one of the questions I always get is, what does a producer do? Um, and, and as you know, being in the business, it depends on what kind of producer you are. But right. you are specifically for Breaking Bad, a line producer. Right. And you're kind of the, that's a position that kind of the glue that holds the production together. Uh, mm -hmm. tell, tell me about what you do. Well, we, I hold the glue in terms of an operational sense. Creatively, Breaking Bad is Vince Gilligan and uh, Michelle McLaren right. and uh, Melissa Bernstein. And, uh, you know, we contribute to that. But um, basically, you can view me as the chief operating officer of the, the show in the sense that right. I set up the facilities, hire the crew, uh, oversee the budget scheduling, and just the day-to-day -day operations interface with the city, okay. uh, handle any of the state issues, any HR things, I'm the one who does the hiring and the firing and uh, tries to keep the show moving forward at all times. Yeah. Now, uh, film, our film liaison here, Ann Lerner, um, jokes that her background in special education and working with uh, behaviorally disturbed children helped her in the film business. But <laughs> I don't know if that's true for you. But and, and that's where I met Ann. She was a <laughs> teacher of mine. Uh, I was having some focus issues. <laughs> some focus issues. But what does, what does make a good producer? Uh, I think that certainly uh, you need to be high energy. You need to have the ability to prioritize what needs to be done because the, the, it's never ending. The tasks are always coming towards you. You have to figure out what is the most important thing at all times and then be adaptable. You can't get thrown by change. You can't hold on to old patterns. You okay. need to... It's, it's uh, you know, you love all your children, but they're all individuals and they have to be treated differently. Right. And that's the, the approach that you take toward a show. They all need something different and your job as the producer is to find out what's going to make that show thrive. Okay. Now, you have, your background is, uh, you went to NYU mm -hmm. to study film and you have some background as, in writing and directing. Why, uh, what... Why line producing, of all the things you could have gone into, why that area? Well, you know, you, you, you go to the party you're invited to. Uh, okay. I okay. certainly uh, loved writing. I, I like directing very much. I still direct second units and, and anything else I can get my hands on. But where it seems that my gifts are, are most appreciated is, is in the organization. Okay. And I've been organizing productions since high school, okay. uh, continued in college organizing senior projects and things like that. It just seemed to be something that I enjoyed doing was to figure out what the vision of the director or the writer, producers mm -hmm. were, okay. and to expedite that, and, and to, to just sort of always try to be innovative and um, efficient in the approach and, and put as much resources on the screen as I always always could do okay yeah get as much money on the screen as you get the you money can. on the screen because they certainly don't see it uh, if you're uh, wasting it behind the scenes right right um, you also we had talked before you also said that uh, being a producer was not a job um, for anybody looking for stability in their life <laughs> talk about that a little bit. well I mean uh, people may not be aware that essentially everybody who's employed on a television show or a movie is just employed for that project that you don't work for Sony as a regular employee. I'm not a regular Sony employee, even when I was on Breaking Bad. Not like the old studio system. It's not, that yeah. studio system doesn't exist, hasn't existed since, well, I, I've been in the business for 40 years. Okay. So I, I've never been a regular employee of anything. Maybe if you do uh, a regular uh, talk show on a, something, but 
not, not in the world that I exist in. It's a project by project basis. So you go in, you start up with a project as a producer. You're probably one of the first people in after it's received its funding and its go ahead. Yeah. And then you assemble the uh, group. You work them uh, like crazy. You work yourself like crazy. And right. then it's over and you look for the next thing. Or you're looking for the next thing while you're working on right. the current thing, right. which, is, yeah. which is much more the uh, uh, efficient. But going from, from job to job to job is maybe you're not going to butt them up against each other, but you, that's, that's the goal. That would be the goal. Catch right. another vine. Right, right. There Keep you swinging go. through the jungle. There you go. There you go. What was your first break getting into producing? Um, was it movie or television? Television. Okay. And what was which show? Was oh, that? I think you know. Essentially, you you just keep moving uh, your way up. Um, you know, you start off. Uh, maybe there are people who start off as producers, but I started off as a director skilled trainee. Oh, and there's a, an open program that uh, people are interested in production. I really recommend them looking into. Okay. It's a paid program. It's not an internship where you're expected to somehow survive on nothing. Okay. Uh, and then I became a second assistant director, then a first assistant director, then a unit manager. Uh, my first full producing credits were on a couple of pilots for studios. Uh, I guess it was Warner Brothers. Uh, I had done a lot of work for them, and they knew me. And... It was a natural uh, evolution in a television sense. I'm not somebody who goes out and seeks funding for my own projects. I'm, I, I work in TV. I enjoy that work. I enjoy the pace. Uh, I enjoy the constant challenge of, uh, of doing TV, especially quality television. You know, when you can get a, get a chance to work on something like Breaking Bad, it exactly. really, really is satisfying work. I think we're doing better work than most movies. Yeah. Well, some people are calling this the golden age of television. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of Breaking Bad, of course, sure. which we're always willing to talk about on this show, uh, big fans. I can't tell you the ending. Okay. Okay. I tried that with Steven, too. He wouldn't give it to me either. Yeah. Even though but, the ending's out, I can't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> you, um, as line, line producer for Breaking Bad, what were some of the... Um, I'm sure everybody has their own favorite show, but sure. what were some of the most difficult challenges you faced as a as a producer in getting uh, something from the script to the screen? Well, in terms of overall um, challenges, doing the pilot was the the biggest one. For oh, us. Wow. Okay. I mean, because it was it was starting up. I didn't know anybody in New Mexico. I didn't know any crew here. I had never worked with Vince uh, Gilligan, uh, oh, who wow. was directing it. Uh, we had an extremely ambitious script. We had no studios. The ABQ studios hadn't been finished yet. We didn't have an office. We wound up in a kind of, I'm not even sure, there were like about 10 offices. You need about 40. We were all on top of each other. And, right. and uh, I thought that was, that's the hardest work I've ever done to just get it organized and up and running. Having said that, there were some extremely challenging episodes that we did on Breaking Bad, I yeah. think that everybody likes to point to the train episode Absolutely. as just, uh, as, as that. But there, there were other episodes. The train, uh, we knew it was coming. Uh, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but uh, it, there was a choice there, actually. Uh, there, it could have gone in a, in a whole other pattern that I'll, I, I can't reveal, but it still would have been the same robbery, but in a whole different way. Uh, hmm. But we, we thought we could get the train and we started planning for that for oh, a couple of months and really? um, okay. we got it, some great cooperation from the, the railroad and a spur of track that nobody was using and then we just got three, essentially three camera units going full time to accomplish mm. that, that shoot. It was I think four days on that location and I think it looks like we shot it for two weeks. Oh, yeah, it looks great. How, how many crew people were out there? That was a pretty desolate-looking oh, area. Oh, it, it is a desolate area. I mean, you go to Santa Fe, make a right turn, make another right, and go another 20 minutes. And <laughs> Now, it looks more desolate than it actually was because we electronically erased the houses that could were visible in that area. Wow. So the magic it, of television, the folks. Well, the magic of, of, <laughs> of certainly editing, of editing yeah. and digital now, everybody yeah. is doing some kind of digital cleaning up Although that is a that was a film show, perhaps the last film show I'll ever get a chance to work on, since everything is now moved into the digital right, realm. Right, right. But uh, in answer to the number of people, my guess is we had about a hundred and 
80 people out there. But oh, that's, so basically the entire crew is out oh, there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we had to set up a branch office in Santa Fe to <laughs> administer to the extras. Well, there wasn't much in the way of extras, but just to administer to keeping the crew up there since we're based in Albuquerque. We had to move people and okay. in order to get, I mean, from the first moment of dawn to the last inch of light we were shooting. Yeah, yeah. And it was in the winter, too, I think. I don't know. It seems like everything you shot was in cold weather, but uh, that's what I heard stories anyway. But it, well, we, we did reason. the last season. We started in December, shooting in December, and so most of it, and it was completed in April. But there was one day um, that uh, we started at I think three degrees, and, oh. and it warmed up into the twenties. But there was one day that Michelle was directing, and she started at I think six degrees at noon and we shot it was called a split call we shot till about one or two in the morning and it was seven degrees at that point so wow. the whole day was just yeah. unbearable but you know that's the thing about uh tv shows and film production you don't you don't get the same hours you don't get the same right. conditions exactly. and essentially nobody complains ever they don't know when they're going home they don't know when they're eating uh, that that's just the nature of the beast. So if you like regular hours and warmth, right. <laughs> or if you like regular hours and, and being cool, yeah. <laughs> since we've also gone to 105 degrees, right. uh, wrong business. Not the not the right place. No. Well, getting back to Breaking Bad, I sure. I wanted to you know I'd asked you before. Um, you've uh, obviously, as I said before, been on numerous TV shows yeah. and movies and some very good TV shows. And where, you know, was there a point in the filming of Breaking Bad when you realized that you had a really great show on your hands, that you knew this was going to amount to something? I think during the pilot. I think oh, that the dialogue it. and the, some of the scenes uh, were unlike anything that I'd ever experienced on any okay. other show. I mean, there was just a, a truthfulness and a character-based reality that was remarkable. Remember, this was 2007. When Vince started right. writing this uh, show about the bleakness of this man's life, the country was in a time of incredible prosperity. When we started shooting uh, in 2007, that was just the beginning of the economic downturn. And so by the time the show came out, it seemed like we were expressing the, the, the spirit of the times, but it was okay. only due to the fact that the country's economy had collapsed. It wasn't part of Vince's initial vision, but it certainly reinforced the impact that the right. show made. Right. Um, but watching Brian and uh, work, watching uh, with some scenes, devastating scenes with Anna Gunn, just some quiet scenes. There's a mm. scene where he's teaching chemistry and he's doing a wonderful job and the kids could not care less. Yeah. Um, that was really seeing something and then there's a very small scene where you see the character eating lunch alone mm -hmm. and this is a place where he's been teaching all the time now i don't know about you right. but i hate eating alone yeah you know yeah. I, I really it's not what i like and to to watch that character have that bleakness and then of course what happens on his birthday i knew we were kind of going to a level of, of depth but look when we started uh broadcasting it wasn't an overwhelming um, audience success by any mm -hmm. means. Right. It really wasn't. Uh, watching that grow over a couple of years was, was really remarkable. Yeah. And then explode at the end. Yeah, you wow. had no, I mean, you can't plan for something <laughs> being a cultural phenomenon. No. Um, and that must have caught, caught you by surprise too at some point. Uh, you know, it's like one of those things where you think you've reached a level and that's what it's going to be. And certainly by the beginning of season four, we were kind of aware that we were, you know, a really solid cult hit. Right. But somewhere between four and five, and, it, and Vince feels that it was due to Netflix and a few other people yeah. catching up, it climbed up. So we get to the end of 5A, uh, those eight episodes, and you think that's the limit, and then it gets into what's going to happen at the end of Breaking Bad, and it skyrockets, and it was amazing. And, yeah. and then, of course, those of us who worked on it, uh, you know, we finished up and then watched the, the, in, the intensity climb 
Right. While we, you know, we we had all stopped. You're just yeah, sitting back. You're We're sitting back, projector. and yeah. and all of a sudden it just takes off, and it's that's all anybody can talk about. It was it was like weird. <laughs> it was. I it mean, was every very strange. Blogs and newspaper everything. articles and TV and everything. I love. I knew it was a different ball game when we started appearing in things like Doonesbury. That was my. Okay. That, I went okay. 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 Now now this is something else. Because okay. we're attracting uh, Gary Trudeau's attention, that that meant a lot. There you go. There you go. Well, we always like to, to talk about the the workforce here. Sure. And uh, Ann Lerner had mentioned to me that uh, the crew base uh, mm -hmm. basically went from about sixty percent New Mexican the first couple of seasons to ending up ninety percent near the end of the series. So, yeah. what what point? And you're the person who does the hiring and firing. Right. What point did you become confident enough that the crews here could handle what? You guys were well, I think out there. this is the difference between a television show and a movie. In a movie, you're there for a short period of time. Uh, everything is flat out, scramble, run as fast as you can for that period of time. TV shows more of a marathon. So in the pilot, that's where the 60, you know, about 65 percent came in. We we basically had to bring people in and right. you know work that way. But as the years went on, every season increased. Uh, we were able to identify more and more local talent. We would have people that we would promote. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, we could do that because these people weren't new to us. We had worked with them, we trusted them, uh, and it was to everyone's advantage to give them uh, an opportunity. They, they certainly were completely dedicated to the show. Mm -hmm. um, we knew we had, uh, they knew us and how we liked to work. Right. And it, it was a, a win all around. So yeah, we did cross into the ninety percent. But you know, part of that is 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 hopefully my experience here when I'm doing the night shift, or mm -hmm. uh, I did a count, oh, just before we finished up, and we were at we were at eighty seven percent by headcount New Mexico crew. Mm. And part of it is yeah, I brought everybody I could from uh, Breaking Bad, absolutely yeah. everyone. Yeah, you know, come on over. Let's uh, and. You know, I, I'd do it again. I mean, this is, th these are people I've worked with for uh, many of them five years, four mm -hmm. and five years. Um, they are terrific. They do great work. We, you know, I mean, I will hold Breaking Bad's production values. I mean, let's set aside the genius of the writing and the directing, right. but I'll just hold the production values, the stuff that we've generated in New Mexico against any show. I mean, we really, it really looks great. It looks different. It looks, uh, it, it expresses the vision that, that Vince wanted us to express. Right. And that's essentially with New Mexico crew. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Nice feather in our hat. Yeah, I think. Hopefully we keep doing it. I know we had talked before, uh, uh, one of the interesting parts of the cultural phenomenon was a sort of a small cottage industry that developed around <laughs> trying to figure out the storylines for Breaking Bad and how it was going to end and stuff and mm. how 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 big a deal how difficult was was it for you know to keep those scripts and storylines secret uh, uh. I I don't think it was um, it certainly was in everyone's interest who worked on the show right. to make sure that the audience had the had the right experience of finding it out as mm the storyteller as Vince wanted it revealed. Right. I mean, we work 14, 15, 16 hours a day to make this show great. Um, and the idea that we were going to subvert it. So I wasn't right. worried about the crew. They were, you know, you could always have accidents. We watermarked scripts. We watermarked call sheets. We put out some things that were uh, deceptive in the sense that we would put out a public call for a, uh, a photo double for a character who we knew was dead. <laughs> okay. that the audience didn't, because there were people who could get to our public stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There were, I mean, that was the easiest part. Uh, but the writing itself was so brilliant. And because of the way you can do a longer version, there were storylines in Breaking Bad that seemed to point toward um, certain conclusions that were just never followed on. I think my favorite is the one where Marie goes to the shrink and talks about poisoning. Well, yeah, well, right. Nothing happened with that. Yeah. 
But if you were a viewer, you, you're looking. You're looking to think, ah, that's they're going to come in this direction. So no, there were a lot of scenes. Uh, I, I think that people should go back, of course, buy the DVD, uh, the collection coming out, and uh, go back, and they'll see that there were some really powerful scenes that pointed very strongly toward certain conclusions that we never went down. Never went and down. I think that was that was an invention of Breaking Bad, or at least that was an opportunity that Breaking Bad could do because it was only telling one story really right. for 62 episodes. Yeah. We could we could go we could take people into blind alleys and leave them there. Yeah. And so nobody got ahead of no, us. Yeah, no, yeah. I didn't get ahead of us. Right. Well, no, you had you had mentioned that it said yeah. you you know that even if somebody had found the script which somebody apparently did get a hold of one on an iPad or something but that there's so many twists and turns that even you didn't know exactly how it was going to end and and you said that Vince until very late in the game, didn't know how it was going to no. end, really. Tell me about that. Well, I, I think that, that um, here's the easiest thing. There, there was a great episode, I think it was um, season three, where our heroes, Walt and Jesse, are in an RV and Hank's outside. Right. Okay, in the junkyard. That, yep. Well, they got them there not knowing how to get them out. Okay. I mean, people would like to think that everything was pre-planned, but I think I remember hearing it took two weeks for them to have the, the inspiration of how to get Hank away from the RV uh, and, and to rescue that. And then, of course, they destroy the right. RV. So, right. yes, Vince knew emotionally where the story was going to end. Uh, he even knew uh, pretty quickly that it was obviously going to involve... Uh, um, Walt taking revenge with that machine gun, but he didn't have all that played out when, when the machine gun first appeared. Okay. And, uh, you know... The, That's a big prop to throw in there when you're not quite sure well, what you're doing with it. You know, uh, as I was talking about in producing, is that, that you can't get thrown by the challenges. I think in the same way these were writers who just felt maybe they would never admit it, verbally, but I think yeah. they felt confident enough creatively that they were willing to take the chance of writing themselves into a corner mm. and then trying to get out. Now, one advantage that we had was there was a long pre-writing period mm -hmm. before we would start production. Sometimes these problems would occur during that pre-writing period. Sometimes we'd be in production and the pressure really amped up. Oh, wow. Right. But um, in general, you know, I think we, we came to pretty satisfying Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, a lot of a lot of people, or several people involved with the show, and and I, I'm thinking of Brian Cranston in particular. He said, you know, that this was the best thing they've ever worked on, and maybe the best thing they ever will work on. And and he still has a long career, I'm sure, ahead of him. No, he's very as, old. As, as he's he's going to be yeah, finishing up be very soon. But, soon. but as as do you and Vince, you guys, does, does it? Does it bother you having a milestone like that, or you just press on and keep working? What's uh, it, do, it absolutely doesn't bother me one bit. If this is the high point of my career, I had it. And, yeah. uh, you know, to be connected, it's going to be a long time before some other show can uh, even begin to challenge Breaking Bad's um, impact in terms of mm -hmm. drama. Uh, but I was part of that, and I was part of it from the very beginning to the very last shot. So I, if, if nothing else approaches that, that's okay. I, I just finished the night shift. It was a wonderful working experience. Uh, very nice people. I got to use the Breaking Bad crew. Uh, again, I continue to work in New Mexico, which I enjoy. Yeah. So I'm not going, uh, we're not, I'm not doing the nostalgia game yet. Okay. I, I think Good. you have to just treat it as, as the special time that it was and then just look forward to having, uh, for what it taught, taught us I think I'm a much better producer than when I started that show I think I can do a lot better work than I even thought I was able to do because it stretched everybody with it yeah everybody yeah. had to start playing an a game and so that's that's fun and I I look forward to bringing that those skills to to other shows great great you, you had said when I asked you that question the first time that that the, the person the only person who really probably needs to worry about their legacy is Vince. He's the one that's got to come up. 
he's the boy genius that's got to come up with another show, right? I mean, I think he'd like the boy genius part, both both <laughs> phrases. Um, I, you know, look, um, I think that I can't wait to see what Vince does next. I'm sure he's going to have a long and wonderful writing uh, career after that. Uh, we're looking forward to Better Call Saul, uh, which right. uh, I don't think is going to be the same tone. Uh, it won't go from that kind of dark comic bleakness. We'll hopefully go from from dark comic to uh, a, a, a different tone. But they're creating this as we speak. I think Vince has a lot to say. Whether it catches the lightning in a bottle or cultural yeah. moment of zeitgeist, I mean, even he didn't predict this. He didn't sure. set out to do this. Sure. So, you know, I, I think we're lucky to have these kinds of high points. Mm -hmm. to, to wish for them again. Um, what I say to my, my wife is, don't think that this is a plateau. It's not. We're on a peak. Right, okay. <laughs> and to get to the next peak, we'll go down, okay. and then we'll try and we'll climb up again. Down, but this is not a plateau. The, nobody exists at this rarefied level for very long, except for the Beatles between 1963 and 70. There you go. That's right. it. Right. That, was, that, was a, that was a hell of a long run. Yeah. Well, I, we've just got a few minutes left. I wanted to ask you about the new show, The Night Shift. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about that, how you got involved in that. And... Um, well, I mean, I do have a reputation for doing quality television in New Good. Mexico, so <laughs> I get those phone calls when, when a show's going uh, up, and it's, it's Sony, so okay. uh, which is the producing company for Breaking Bad. So it was a lot of uh, oh, okay. old friends and, and uh, rolling, you know, rolling right into it. I helped, um, I didn't shoot the pilot, but I helped set it up. And so when those people weren't available, it was natural that it kind of rolled into, uh, into my lap. And uh, I was happy to, to, to have it. We started uh, prepping, I started prepping the show in June. We were here in July. We were shooting in August. And now we just finished up last week. And now it'll go on the air. We're not sure exactly when, most likely late February, early March. And then if the audience likes it, We'll do more. We'll do more. Now, this is more, uh, I, I guess the term is ensemble cast. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily focused on a single person's story. It's, um, it's really about this group of doctors in a San Antonio emergency room. Uh, you know, the pressure on, on medicine, the pressure on emergency rooms in particular are what the story's focus is, is on. A couple of the doctors have, as many of them do in, in San Antonio, very close ties to the military. Um, many of them are, uh, I mean, the, the executive producers and I went to San Antonio. There's some wonderful facilities for veterans there. Center for the Intrepid uh, is a remarkable, remarkable place. We spent most of a day there. And, and, the, and the care that people are getting is, is, is terrific. But emergency rooms are, are the medicine's first line of defense in right. this country. Right. And um, anybody can walk through the door and people get treated. And... Uh, Certainly, the doctors in our show bring a uh, some of them bring a military uh, perspective mm -hmm. to how to treat under the most incredible conditions, and they're brave and they're smart, and and we hope that uh, well, they like it. It's a, it's an ensemble piece. It's an episodic piece. And Breaking Bad was one big story. Right. This is separate stories. Okay. Uh, we do follow character arcs, and um, it's it's much more like a regular TV show in that sense. Okay. Well, we've just got a minute before we have to wrap sure. up here. Um, you, you said you're already done with the night shift now. You shot the episodes and you're waiting to hear if they're sure. going to order more. Um, so you're, you're between jobs now, is it? Well, I'm not quite between <laughs> jobs. In three days, I'll be between jobs. Oh, in three days. Okay. Yes. Right. No, you, you just simply put out the word. You know, we, in many ways, we all have two jobs. The job we're doing and the job we're trying to get. Right. Or trying to get a job as a job, and that's the way you have to be in in the in the in the freelance business. Everybody, right. everybody has the same thing. Now it's great when pe the phone rings, uh, but you never know when that's going to happen, and uh, you just hope that your work speaks for itself and that you know enough people that uh, they will remember you. And that's the way you have a career. Okay. Well, great, um, Stuart. I want to thank you for sure. being with us today. I really enjoyed this and. Uh, I want to thank all of you out there for joining us on Behind the Scenes. I'm your host, Tony Delaflora. We'll see you next time.